Oh, I forgot about that one up there too. Let's see, hopefully I have space on there. I almost forgot to get the palette in there. And that's pretty handy to have in the video. All right, so we're working on greens. And I'm gonna be starting off with some bigger brushes. All right. So what I want to demonstrate primarily is that we don't have to use green paint to create greens. I have some green paint on here. I have my thalo green. In fact, I just switched that from over here to over here on my palette. So don't get confused when you see this in the video later. I have my sap green deep right here and then my thalo green, but I don't I'm not dependent on those. They're just to facilitate, make things faster. They're just convenient is all it is. And I've tried different greens over the years, Viridian and Chromium and a lot of different greens on here. I used to I use Sap Green for many, many years. I've gotten away from it a little bit because I found the Sap Green Deep and but it's the Sap Green Deep is much cooler than the Sap Green is. Definitely cooler, more on the blue side of things. So uh, for the most part, I'm using my yellows and my blues to create my greens. Uh, well, actually, yellows, reds, and blues <laughs> to create my greens. So we're gonna look at creating, even within this, this is a spring scene right here, and very much green. You know, when somebody looks out, often they just say, oh, it's so green, what on earth am I gonna paint? So we're gonna show that green is not just green. There are so many different greens out there. All right, so first I'll lay in a little bit of sky and I keep monking the camera. Lay in some sky. In fact, I'm gonna have just a Add a bit of green into that sky as well. Use some walnut oil. And we're gonna, I'm gonna try to demonstrate this fairly quickly. Yes, I'm using Viva. It's just the others are just a little bit more crunchy and even though I'm disgusted with Viva changing their composition, they they still have something. I'm, I'm actually going to start using rags. I, we generally take all of our old clothes that the kids, as they grow and grow out of them, we've always taken them to Goodwill and given them away. And the other day we had some big bags of them and I thought, I think I could repurpose these. What could I do with them? And then I started thinking about, oh, I can do my painting with them. Because they're soft, I mean, especially old t-shirts and things, right, yeah. they're soft and fairly lint-free. And why not just use those? And then I can just, when I'm done for the day, I throw them in the washing machine. I mean, these things are supposed to be, well, I don't know. This, uh, well, supposedly these oil paints are non-toxic that I'm using. They don't have true cadmium in them or any of that. So I don't know, maybe not. <laughs> the color may not come out, but the, oh yeah, I'm not worried about it staining. Yeah, I, no, I wouldn't worry about that on the. Just couch. so I can use them again. About, yeah, maybe the oil in the, in, the, in the washing machine. Or, you know, oh. Regular clothes coming out, with, you know, like this. I will try it out and see how it works. Yeah. It might not work. <laughs> if it doesn't work, then it doesn't work, okay. and then I'll just use them until. They're no longer usable and throw them away. We but, mm -hmm. So I'll, I don't know, I'll see. Viva's been very disappointing that way. All right. Uh, and we want to create this coming a little bit farther down this way then. Okay, so overall the day is very bright and I'm adding more blue into that than what you see in the reference material because that's just bleached out. 
So I will. Is that how you can tell? Hmm? Is that how you can tell that there, it's a very bright day? Is because the sky is that bright? Well, I remember the day. Oh. I, I I remember taking the photo and and the feeling of the day and all of that. So it's one of those days where it's there's just a little bit of haze in the day. It's not like a crisp blue clear sky, but it's it's one of those. It was a kind of day that reminded me of growing up in Southern California, where there was always that, I don't know, have you ever been in Southern California? The ocean, there's always moisture in the air and that sort of thing. That was the kind of day. So we'll get a little bit brighter as we come down. See, there's that fuzz from these new, yeah. these junky vivas. That's where I forgot about that. Ah, oh, that just does not work anymore. <laughs> oh no, I've got plenty of the Kirkland paper towels in there. It's just ah, they just—they're not quite as soft, and they're just not there. But oh well. That's like uh, the reason I'm making a new outdoor painting palette in easel. The other ones just don't quite have everything I want yeah. from it, so I have to figure out something else that will work. Okay, so that'll work for this guy. So let's get into right into some greens. I can use the same paintbrush that I just did the sky with. And let's see. Now, for some, they find it helpful to come in, and I'm not going to use my greens brush for this right off, but to uh, lay in, I don't often do this. In fact, I rarely ever do it. But some people like to come in on a scene like that when we have a river and they might draw in their scene a little bit, actually. Come down a little bit more. Can So this sort of thing. But to me, drawing in the river, the, the other spaces, I mean, I can do that so quickly with big swatches of color. Mm -hmm. All right. So now I can just vary up these greens, like the tops of those trees, because it's just spring, they're more on the, the yellow-green side rather than the blue-green side at the very tops of them. They're catching a lot of light and they're still in the early stages of blooming out or the, you know, the leaves coming out. So so I, first I establish where I want my trees. And break up those bases a bit. So I have a few major groupings of trees. One right here one right here, and one over this direction. But I'll be putting those trunks in afterwards, so... All right, so I've got the main yellow trees in, and a little bit down in here, and we can pull some of this color down in other places first. Okay, so I also want, since I have so much green on this bank of the river, I want to pull some warm kind of brown color into that. So I'll get into my little alizarin crimson and some transparent oxide red and pull some of that down in here first before I really start laying in the other greens. Just to, just to get rid of that white 
so I'm not fighting with that later. And I like the con the complement of the green, the red undertone with the greens. It helps to offset the feeling of overly green, just greenness or whatever. Like Jean said earlier, it's oh, it's hard, tough to be green, or it's hard being <laughs> not, easy not easy being green. There you go. For a little Kermit. Now you can see too, I put in that little bit of yellowish green into this bank first. And then when I laid on that transparent oxide red and all that on top of that, it already gives a very pleasant mix of colors there. They're already kind of in harmony with each other. Okay, and then we have a shadow area. It's more on the lavender side of the browns, which means I'm putting a little bit more blue and crimson into it. Over here on this bank of the river. And you see, I don't have to use like the walnut oil. I use it primarily just when I have big swashes of color so that it can make it f more fluid, but it's not necessary. You don't have to use any medium at all and make it work. If I find that my paint isn't flowing as readily as I'd like it to, mm -hmm. then I'll grab some walnut oil, put it in there. Does it leave a shine for your paint? Oh, that is one thing I do like about it, especially with my under. I'm glad you brought that up. I do like that it helps the colors to not sink in so much when they dry, especially the darks, the way they get all matte and sunken. It helps to keep them more wet looking, more fresh. So that is one reason why I do enjoy when I do use it. That's one of the reasons I use it in my washes so that my darks don't sink so badly. Now, the color I just laid in, I just took, added some white to that lavender mix that I had because we have a lot of fallen logs and things down in there and they're lighter. So I'm introducing some of this lavender in here to give more of that feeling of those fallen logs and things that'll be along the bank without spelling them out yet, if I do at all because really I'm up on a high bank looking down on this scene overall. And then the trees go up a bank on the other side, a hill. Then we also have all those areas of shadow greens in there. All right, so actually maybe I'll use, uh, I'll do a different brush just to keep my greens cleaner. So here I did just grab some because I'm used to doing that just for the speed of it. Maybe I should keep it more to the yellows and blues so you can see how it's mixable from either direction. But I just grabbed some of the sap green deep. And I'm going to add more of that phthalo blue into it. And maybe a little bit of the, let's see, just to warm that up. Actually, I need some transparent oxide yellow into that too. And since this is a one of the colors that sink when they dry, I'm going to add a little bit of walnut oil in there. So then we can come in here and create some of the shadows. And already we're getting a fun mix of different greens between the yellow greens and the blue greens. And then 
this over here is much darker. And it's shadow. And hmm? what's that? Well, if mine looked like that at that stage, I would panic. <laughs> <laughs> Are you saying that the, my painting doesn't look good? <laughs> Thanks. All right. Okay, so now I'm going to start to warm that up a little because we get into deeper shade, shadows. As we come into this area over here, there's a lot of trees in here and they're much more sunken, so, or uh, much uh, thicker and a lot more of them. So I'm putting these in and then I'll come back with some of the, like the tree that's here in front, all those highlighted areas I'll do on top of that. But I want to have all these shadows as much, at least it's helpful to have a lot of that already back behind before I put the other on top of it. I didn't need that. So this is with transparent oxide red mixed in here and the... Mm, boy, I'm just not pulling these colors out of my head quickly. Cadmium yellow medium and the different blues that I'm using. Just to change up having a constant change in variety of color and tone and value makes the painting much more interesting. And then we have some even different greens over here as well. See more than three colors together to come up with here. Yeah, I mix all kinds of colors together, yes. A lot of people <laughs> don't think you can do that, right? Mixing more than three colors uh, together? I don't know. I guess, I mean, like uh, Soroya, his palette was very limited. Some people believe in very limited palettes. I don't. I believe in using whatever is convenient and what works for you. But they, I've, I've been told that if you mix more than three or four, then you get mud. Oh, no, if you, well, mud is a relative term. Usually what that means is your color temperature's off. That's all that mud is. If a painting doesn't feel like it's working, it's usually because the drawing isn't working or the color temperature is not working. So, mud, uh, yeah, that's, that's, that's very relative, uh, subjective term. But you can get... Oh, well, let's see here. What do I want to say about that? Mm. You can mix all kinds of colors together as long as they continue to work for you. So that's what experimenting with your colors is all about. Making the color charts is hugely helpful. But overall, if it looks good on my palette, there's no reason it's not going to look good on my painting if I'm putting it next to colors that it would work with. And then if you, in a minute here, if you look at my palette, you'll see several different colors of green on here. Where was that picture taken? This is just right down here on White River Boulevard. Really? Mm hmm. A lot of beautiful places here in Muncie. Mm -hmm. Just have to get out and look. Yep. Wasn't really walking on the trail behind you here. Oh, yeah. We, we love this greenway back here. We go out there all the time. So, as I do this, I'm also trying to think of. Uh, 
my patterns, light and dark, creating movement and all of that. And with all of those situations as well, there's nothing that says I have to have a certain pattern or sense of movement or anything. It's all in what I want to create with my work. So, or what you want to create when you're doing your paintings. But I have, I have certain things that I look for that I find fun and pleasing in my work. And a lot of that is especially contrast the, the movement that light and dark makes in a painting. Can you start to see the, how we're shaping up with the different structures of trees and all of that? A separation of things. And so. Last green where we turned it around. Oh, good. And then you can see that there were some houses back in there. That's the sort of thing that at any moment I can come in then. I don't have to put those in right away. <laughs> so I can come in after all this is in here and put in a fence. I can put in a roof over here and put in a little house or a tree or, you know, I mean, a house or a, a fence or a barn or a shed or whatever, whatever it is that I want to put in there. Maybe they don't have to be obvious about what they are. And, and then if I want to really show that light over there catching on the side of it, that one wall. You know, the, that's the thing with Impressionism or with any kind of painting, you can do whatever you want with it. I just put in kind of a semblance of something at the moment, but then, you know, as I go along, I can come back in with, with a, a shadow and start to shape things out more and make them stronger put in some kind of little plants or bushes or something to break up edges and create it, make it feel like it's some kind of a yard over there or whatever. So you don't have to do everything exactly the way that you see it right off the bat. And I put in the colors that I did rather than what's necessarily in the picture to kind of go with some of the colors that I'll have down here and help pull them up in there. But I can also play with a mix of lavenders as well, which are always fun to put into a painting. Or I could turn it completely around and put a spot of red on the roof up there. Charge up my painting a little bit. And help to um, give some complement to all the greens that we'll have in there. So what do you use to mix that? Mix what? The red? I just took my pile of lavenders where I had, where it transitioned from transparent oxide red and a little bit of lizard and crimson into using a combination of the different blues like the thalo and the ultramarine mixed with the crimson to make up some of my blues and also white. And then I just grabbed my cadmium red medium and put it right on top of those mixes and mixed a little bit and then put that in there. But of course, I don't like this pattern that I have right now 
I just put some of that because it's like a straight line and I would break that up here eventually and most of that will disappear. But it gives you a fun horizon. Yeah, if I want to have that kind of a horizon in there. All right. Now a lot of this will start to feel like something when I start to put in the branches and and trunks and all of that too. Those will start to take on their particular structure. But you, a lot of this I'm pushing too to show you how not to become attached rigidly to a, any kind of photo references. The photo is just not going to capture what was actually there when I was standing out there and enjoying the scene. So, unfortunately, I don't have a study of this scene. I would use that to do my painting from. But I thought that this one, out of most of what I had, really captured a lot of the greens of springtime well. So it seemed like a good one to play with greens today. All right, so then... We'll get in some of that water as well. And one thing about that day, springtime, we have what, lots of rain, and so the water tends to be a little bit on the muddy side, doesn't it? So there's not a lot of color in the water on a day like that. Okay, so to get that color, and actually, that turned out pretty close to what you see as far as the reference material goes, right? To get that color, I just took... Oh, crud, how did I get that color? <laughs> we'll, have to watch, we'll have to watch the video. <laughs> um, oh, boy, you know what? I just drew a blank. What did I do? <laughs> uh, so now if I tell you because, because I started talking... <laughs> I completely took it out of my head. <laughs> I would tell you, this is what I did, and then you'd look at the video and say, okay, you moron, you have no idea what you're talking about. <laughs> uh, so if I, if I intuitively tried to do it again, I'd be able to do it again, but I can't tell you what I did at that moment to get that color. So you have to look at the video. It's not on here. No. Okay. Oh. Uh, all right. So... <laughs> so now, in order to break up that river, you know, to get the bank, we can come in with, we've got that nice green color out here. It's that bright green that we get in the springtime out here, right? But I can still, with all of that, keep much of that undercolor that we had. And that helps that, so that it's not, hopefully, overpowering, overpowering in its greenness. And then, of course, we want to have some shadows. So, let's see. I'm going to keep, intentionally, I, I, I keep meaning, trying to go over here to this stuff, but... I'll stick, I'll try to stick primarily to the blues and yellows so that you can see how to mix greens from those, especially once you have the video to look at. Did you remember? <laughs> yes. I don't have to remember. It's being recorded. I, at least I hope it's being recorded. So true. <laughs> as long as the recording works, sometimes they don't. Okay, so to create a shadow green, I don't just use necessarily the blues and the, and the yellows. I also come in here and grab something like a lizard crimson to help darken that up. But these shadows, because it is, it's not a, it's not really an overcast day. The shadows are a little bit warmer because it does have a bit of that haze, but it's, it's bright enough as far as like a sunny day that the shadows aren't going to be really warm. They're going to be 
they're going to still tend to be on the cool side of things. So I'm not going to warm them up like I would on a really overcast type day. Okay, so I can come in and put a shadow in to some of these little things and make them turn into plants of some kind. You can come around there, Julie, right over in that spot there if, if you want. Oh no, don't worry about that. I've, there's plenty of space right there. In front of the, in front of the table right there even. You won't even be... No, I'd sit in front of that table right there. It's probably going to be a lot better. Unless, of course, that distorts the color too much as well. Whoa, I did not know you were there. Okay. All right. And then, of course, with that sort of thing, there's some highlight out on top of some of these. Kind of a halo highlight on some of them. And actually, more of that. The cooler yellow. There's, it's bright enough that we're going to have some pretty good highlight areas on a lot of this. But you can see how just those little things, you can start to form bushes and, and other structures pretty quickly, especially when you get the contrast between the shadow and the highlight areas. But a lot of artists are afraid of contrast, so they don't ac actually end up putting in dark enough shadows and bright enough Highlights. How did you get the clay color again? The river? No, the... Oh, your... Oh, down here? Yes. Uh, transparent oxide red with the a little alizarin crimson. And then, of course, I took that, that initial yellow, a green that we were using. I put it in first. So then when I put that down, they kind of blended together a little bit and softened one another and it softened up the value as well it wasn't as dark so i have this shore right now is kind of a straight line i'm going to break pull that in and out a little bit too so it's not so straight and i do like the idea of a little bit of blue coming. It's actually more of a lavender, but I think on the water over here. Just give more of the a little break up to that expansive. brownish green water and okay let's see so now we need to break this guy up big bunch of green tree there Say, nobody better get in my way. <laughs> okay. Now these trees that are in here, these tree trunks, they are dark. I think I might try out this guy here. This long brush, is that on there? Yeah. It's very long bristled brush. And they're a lot of fun to use. They're almost, they're kind of similar to using the long bristled langnickel brushes that I have. These right here. But the bristles don't fall out. <laughs> and, and they, uh, 
they're, they're obviously stiffer. It's a bristle brush rather than the mongoose. What? Who makes that? This one was Utrecht, I think. Yeah, Utrecht. But you can get you can get them from. No, this is a round or a filbert. Filbert. What is that one? Hmm. Yeah, I think this is a filbert. It's a filbert long, is what it is. I've had them for so long. Don't remember. And sometimes I I, I wasn't sure because. It might have just been used so much that it rounded out, <laughs> but, oh. <laughs> but it's not. It started out as a filbert. So I'm going to use this for some of those trunks. And I'm going to keep the trunks a little uh, to a great extent on the crimson side of things because I want that contrast a bit of uh, uh, that harmony of the reds with the green trees. Mm, but not like glaringly, hopefully. So let's see. And then when I say that those are really dark, get them dark and then I have to tone them down a bit because I'll end up getting them too dark otherwise. And remember, they look big, but that's all relative. So proportionally speaking, don't want to get carried away with the size of them. Otherwise, it, if we make these things too big, the trees, then we won't have the same feeling of size and distance that I'm trying to create with this. So I want the trees to feel as if they're big trees, but not big on the on my painting. All right, so if you notice, well, I, I just thought, thought about what I was doing. I twist and turn the brush to see as I'm doing that, just to create more, mm, I don't know, scraggly feeling, I guess, in there as I do it. And you notice I am not worried about getting these things perfect or refined right off the bat here. Don't have to. After I've got them placed where I want things, then I can think about refinement. And then I'll know which ones I want to refine more than others. Just up there. Okay.
So as we add the trunks and things, we can start to bring a much more recognizable structure to everything. But we don't have to start out with that structure. In fact, often if I put in those little trees and branches and things to begin with, then I, it constrains me and I'm not as, I'm not as, uh, I'm not as free to just let the color and movement dictate the painting as much. You know, I, I, I become constrained by, oh, there's a tree here. I need to kind of, I have to work around those parameters and it just becomes much more inhibiting. So if I start off with more of the big structures, then it's, it's more freeing and, I'm, and I can play and, and move things around more readily that way. So then we... Come into this here, and we've got definite shadow areas and trunks down in there. And we also have some stronger shadow areas in there. So I will, I will definitely want to break this up with highlighted leaves and all that after a while. Otherwise, this will be so dominant, nobody will be able to look at the rest of the painting very well. But there's no rush on anything when we're doing this. As long as, as long as we start out with a definite plan and idea of what it is we're wanting to achieve, then starting off with abstract shapes and patterns isn't going to affect us because we're not looking, we won't, even while I'm putting in those, those shapes, I'm not thinking, oh crud, what was that shape? I have in my mind the overall picture that I want to create, the feeling that I want to get in the painting. And so all of those are just temporary and I know they're temporary and I'm looking at it in terms of what it's going to be when it's finished more than I am, what have I just put in there right now? See? So that's why they don't, it's harder when you're looking at it from not, you know, not as the artist, but as a spectator, not knowing, well, what is that going to be? Whereas in my mind, it's already formed into, to a great extent into what it's going to be. So it makes it a little bit easier on me already having that image in my head than with you watching and trying to figure it out. So see, I put in this light area, then I can pull the little tree trunk down over the top of it. Then I'm going to apply some leaves and branches to, or leaves to, and things here in a minute that will help to break up that big space as well. Same thing if I could always come in with some more of it into little areas back in behind 
creating this. All that light just hitting on the outside edge of that bank. There's nothing that says we can't break up some of these greens with a smoke bush or something else, you know, that can add a little bit of color in there. And then I might make up a huge pile of <laughs> color, like what I just did with the yellow and this orangey or yellow reddish stuff here, and then just use a little bit of it. But I want to make sure I have enough paint there that when I lay something in here, I can get the texture and everything else that I want there without having to go back in and try to add more again. I want to get it right off when I set it down there as, as much as possible. So same thing I can now, actually not that one, use a little bit of that. Hmm, actually, I like that color first before I tone it down. bright tree kind of lying in the sun out here and we can use some of that same texture up into these areas
doggy. That is, that is Esther. There's one that's been barking for a long, there's a dog that's been barking for a long time back. Yeah, that's a, that's some neighbor dog. Yeah. And Esther, if I would tell her to be quiet, she's pretty good. She usually will bark when someone's around, but you know, if they're not on our property, we try to make sure that she knows not to bark like that. What kind of dog is it? She's an Eskimo German Shepherd mix, but she looks like a fox. Oh, wow. Really, very much like a fox. Yeah. Very long, skinny face, long ears, and skinny, skinny body. She's a dart. She loves to run, and she's very fast. So she's a nice dog, very friendly, and that dog that's barking now—that sounds like one that we have a catty corner behind us. Mm -hmm. And if people go off, I don't know if the dog goes out mm -hmm. and then it'll bark the whole time. Incessantly. Oh. I finally called the man one time. Well, I called the neighborhood association mm -hmm. and said, who moved into that mm -hmm. house? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. They gave me a phone number and I called and he, he said, are you a neighbor? I said, do you have a dog? And he said, yes. I said, is it outside? Uh, and it, this was a bitter cold day, and I said, I think it really needs to be let in. It's mm -hmm. been barking for over an hour. Aww. And he said, are you a neighbor? <laughs> who is this? <laughs> and I, I answered, yes, it was a neighbor, but I didn't tell who I was. It, what, it really, did, if you know that it's been barking for an hour, then yeah. well, about that should be enough. Later, mm -hmm. I, I think he must have been at work or somewhere. Yeah. Uh-huh. Uh, he came home and the dog, I didn't hear the dog, but it's too cold. It, it, it is too cold, and it, but even if it's not cold, I don't want to hear a dog barking. Oh, no. And I want that sound, and I love animals, but mm -hmm. I, I don't want to hear it. it no, it, it's annoying. I yeah. can't tune it out. You right? can't focus much on anything else no. if a dog's barking no. like that, unfortunately. Simba's where we have that church across the street. Mm -hmm. So if people are walking pretty much and they come up to the other side of the street, he'll watch them and maybe he'll. <laughs> <laughs> but if they come across the street, yeah, or, then he'll start barking. Yeah. It's one thing to have a situation where you can't do much with your dog for a day mm -hmm. and it has to be out or something but when you do that every day you shouldn't have an animal no, yeah, <laughs> if, if you have to keep it tied up so it's barking all day long every day More of these bright, bushy trees in here. This poor Melman. Bill, what's going to be your focal point there on the painting? No, I'm not. I don't know. I don't. I'm not really too worried about a focal okay. point. 
A focal point, it's necessary if that's what we want in a picture. Otherwise, focal point's really not necessary. There's no, there are no rules in art. So you can do whatever you want. That's where I was in an art show and the, the juror said, sorry, but you have too many. You don't have one dominant focal point. I said, so? <laughs> Who said I have to have one dominant focal point? And nobody. Who's, where's the uh, art police that tell everybody that this is the way it's supposed to be? So if you want to have a focal point, then put one in. Now, it might be disquieting for the viewer if there's not a definite thing to look at. And if you don't want it to be disquieting, then you might want to do something, put in some kind of a focal point. Well, like on your flowers, for example, some of them you define more intently mm -hmm. than others. And I thought maybe in a landscape, you would do the same type of... And I might end up doing that. But I, right now, I'm just having a lot of fun with color and shape and pattern. <laughs> so, so that's why, as far as the actual focal point, I haven't decided if I want one or not. So I wasn't trying to be cavalier or flippant or anything. It's just that that's where it comes down to you as an artist have to decide what is it that you're wanting to focus on yourself. And do you want the viewer to have one area that they're looking at, that they're concentrating on? Or do I want just to have a big party of colors and, and shapes and that sort of thing. My main intent is to make sure that all of them come together and, and work well as a, as a whole, as a structure. So like with, these, with this house, I might end up putting a bigger roof in here and making that a focal point, making that one of the more definite centers of interest, I should say. Water's really coming along great. Uh, thank you. You know, I sat over there close looking at the water. Actually, there's a lot of uh, lavender uh, right, yes, yes. right here. And, it, and there's a lot of lavender right there. Mm -hmm. I wish I could do this example. Oh, I'm sure that would be for the rest of the day. Jean is bothering me. Uh, <laughs> Jean, that's... <laughs> well, we sent her to the corner last time and it didn't work, so we'll just have to live with it, I suppose. So, some branches because there's so many little leaves around them. I want a more broken up feeling to them. And other branches are, I want to really have them stand out, delineate them from everything else around them. So using this little round brush is a little bit easier to get a nice crisp, small stroke like that. What, what size round brush is that? I don't know. Four. This is an eight. <laughs> so when I said little, that's relative. Yeah. And this is where color. Little branches that far away, they may look white, but, and a lot of them, I mean, to it, like that's mostly on the white side of things. But it's also fun to, to get some color into these if it works. Mm. Thank you. 
and this is what I love about branches is you can come in and break up a space so nicely with them and you can shape them any way that you want to to break up a space however you want to. Branches are one of the more fun parts in painting, I think. And then, of course, you know, like with that, what we've talked about in other videos, if I want that to stand out even more, what do I do to make something feel lighter? You come in with something darker nearby, and you can pop that even more away from the spot. So sometimes I'll do that by taking the light and putting it over the top of something that's dark already there, kind of like with some of these dark branches here. So even though in the photo there aren't any branches that are bright like that, I want them in there anyway, so I'm going to put some in there. That's what it's all about. It's my imagination. I can do whatever I want with these. So I can play as if the sun is, or the light that's there is coming and hitting on those so that they stand out. Now that one is obnoxious. So I will change that. I sat on it too long. Me too. Yeah. Yeah. That chair might be a little high for my legs and I get kind of sliding off. Oh. Oh. That's why I don't like to sit down when I paint. I like to stand and walk. Well, I like to walk back and forth from it anyway. You know, when I get up close, I like to then step back and get a good view of it, and I like to look in the mirror. So, and then you go, sitting down. You are a good person. <laughs> <laughs> yes. After each brushstroke, I like to look in the mirror and make sure my hair is in place. What little of it I have. Huh? <laughs> oh. <laughs> There's a show. What is that? The guy looks at himself and, or the, it's an animated, oh, what was that? And then, uh, are you talking about a cartoon? Yes, I love cartoons. Well, good cartoons. Except for, oh, do not go see it. We had heard all these things from people about how hilarious the SpongeBob movie was. And we saw the previews to it. I don't like the SpongeBob cartoon. I think it's inane. Just a complete waste of brain tissue. But everyone said it was so funny. We were going to take the kids to a movie. And the previews made it look like it wasn't the TV version of SpongeBob. It was an animated, they're above ground cartoon. No. That's just like this little teeny portion of the movie. It's stupid, oh. stupid movie. It was all the same. All the same thing. They're just, they're underwater. It's just, it's just like watching it on TV, uh, the TV seen version. It, so I, I, I know who he is. And they eat crap cakes. And... Yeah. What? I mean, uh, the, the majority of the movie was the same look, everything, the same. This is if you were watching that. Why on earth do you have to come to the movies to watch something like that? Ah. Yeah. Uh, that's so frustrating. They, the previews did not give that impression, and probably for a very good reason. Nobody, they wouldn't have had nearly as many people coming to watch it. We would have sa it would have saved us, however much it cost us. Actually, it would have just. There was one line in the movie that I used after the movie. There went two hours of my life. Yeah, right. <laughs> He said something about there was two. There went two minutes of my life. Yeah. Well, that was exactly my feeling. Oh, well, that's too bad. I know it was probably hot on your minds that wow, I'm going to be. That's exactly what I was going to do right after this class. But I thought I would. That I would save you from the torture. And that was terrible. You know, see that I just did that. And then that <laughs> rookie move. <laughs> <laughs> We're rather an unorthodox class. <laughs> <laughs>
got Bill all upset. <laughs> See, last week was spring break for everybody and oh. Danny and Enoch and everyone, so yeah. we went out and we got to go sledding. That was awesome. Oh, yes, we had one perfect day of, actually two perfect days of sledding. One perfect day was warmer. The other oh. day was almost perfect, but it was pretty cold. Where'd you go? Over to McCullough Park. Oh, yeah. They have a decent hill. It's not like Colorado where no, we... No, But it still was fun. Just a little hill. Indiana, uh-huh. That's where I kids. <laughs> I always have trouble with the edge of the, the bank yeah. where the water and the camera looks like I don't break it up enough, I guess. Yeah, that's when I first put this in here, mm -hmm. I talked about how, yeah, it's a straight line, mm -hmm. but then we're going to break that up and, and, and I still have to move some color. down into like here so that it comes out a little bit more and even breaks that up more there. Like there's shadow yeah, area that's in exactly here. What it looks like. Shadow. Good job. Same thing. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> okay. And then I can break that up even more by pulling a couple of logs branches and stuff sticking out into here, down into the water. And so then we don't have the same space all the way, although it is still kind of a straight line. I should, I should have created more curviness in there. It doesn't look straight. No, it doesn't. No. Because of all the debris. Uh, debris. So is this giving you a good sense of build up and and variety see in branches they don't have to be going the same direction as the flow of the water either oftentimes they do kind of get pushed that way by the water but they're branches so if the tree just fell over they can be stuck in all kinds of different directions Uh, it's okay um, because it made you feel like you were flying and then you go over oh I love those that's so great we went to an IMAX like that it, it was a uh, hang gliders uh, or gliders not just hang gliders but they had gliders they had hang gliders all of it and you felt like you were just moving with it it was awesome did they have I don't remember. It was like yeah. 20 years ago. So. Did they have the same one where you were on the top of a tree and you were like one of the monkeys and you went down for head first? I don't remember that part. <laughs> that was crazy. <laughs> oh, man. Oh, I probably improved one of those since we went so long ago. Yeah, it was great. Tom was going, you okay, Mom? <laughs> Oh, 
Have you ever been flying in a small four, no, two, or four-seater plane? Yes. Those are fun, too. In the IMAX theaters, you mean? No, in, in real. real yeah, in real. A helicopter is the one that threw me off because they, they're, like, tip-heavy, and um, like a plane doesn't do that. I yeah. haven't been in a helicopter yeah. yet. Oh, that's kind of... <laughs> Sounds awesome, though. Christy and I would both love to get our pilot licenses someday. Oh. Well, my niece has hers. My son's got a bunch of hours in. Uh huh. My son has a lot of these hours in, oh, but really? he don't have his license. Christy's dad was graduated from the Air Force Academy. He was a fighter pilot, so. Mm -hmm. She had more air time by the time she was two than any of the cadets. <laughs> oh, <wow. laughs> it was pretty, pretty fun for her when she was little. Now, where are her parents? Her dad lives in Colorado, and her mom is in Wyoming right now. Her, oh. she, was in, uh, she was in Kentucky working on a horse ranch there. Oh. But now she is with Christy's, living with Christy's brother down in Wyoming. Oh, okay. So they're all spread out, aren't they? Mm-hmm. Yep. So see, now, really what I'm going through is just refining different areas and bringing things up to a more finished state, even though it's all loose and, and fairly impressionistic in feeling. I want to get some areas so that they push and pull more. And, but I've got the, the basic structures and, and all of that in place so that now it's... It's just a matter of determining how much I want to refine different areas. From here on out, it's just very subjective. It all depends on what I think will increase the strength of the painting overall. And sometimes I end up doing it too much and just ruin the whole thing, but that's... The stronger our mental plan and images the is the better we're the less we're going less likely we are to overwork it and I'm kind of thinking a nice bright roof back here might do the trick might be good to have back in there and then I'll I can lay a tree more of a tree in there as well Create a bright structure down here. Maybe one that way. And then I'll have to have a little shadow area. Pick in that in there. Help define that roof some. But overall, they, you know, doesn't doesn't have to be like a uh, a, a real detailed. Ref uh, what am I trying to think of? It doesn't have to be a carefully rendered structure. It can be as, as loose and, and kind of ambiguous as much of the rest of the painting is. Mm -hmm. And I think I actually need a little bit more of that shadow down in some of these areas. Help. Mm, 
That was terrible. I think it helped it. That made it look more not straight. Mm. And I. Yeah, it sure is. And then I can also do some more with some of this to help break up the straightness of everything and do the same thing in another area where I pull some more water down maybe, but that I'll have to think about if I want to do that or not. Uh, let's see. So up in these areas, with these upper, I've concentrated a lot down in here. So up in here, I would start to do the same thing with a lot of these branches. Just put in until I felt I had achieved it, a lot more little branches. So I got the main trunks, the main structure of, of the trees and groupings the way I wanted them. But then I can come in with like smaller trees in here and just break up some of these areas. Not all the trees have to go all the way to the top. And those should be... And then some trees should come back behind the, and stop at the roof line. And then others we can pull down over the roof line. That way we've got that, we're creating that depth in there. Push and pull of spaces. There's one of those barkers. That, I don't even recognize that bark. It's like there's a dog roaming around out there or something. Uh, once in a while there's a neighbor that lets a dog out over here. So with these, uh, in developing up the, the upper portion, it would be a, a constant kind of play for me of branches. Like what do I want to stand out here? Especially uh, of thick and thin branches, lots of little thin ones. And then putting leaves, intermixing a lot of leaves and things into there. I won't uh, know exactly how many I want until I've achieved the feeling that I want from it. So there's, it's not, I don't have it. When I say to have a plan in my head, that doesn't mean I know every little brush stroke and all that sort of thing. I just have an overall feeling and idea from it that I want. But that's it. I still leave a lot of room for play in there. This, the way I'm holding the brush too, that helps me to keep a looser flow to everything. I'm holding the brush back on the end of the brush instead of up, I think up the close. The chisel tip there helps immensely. Oh I yeah. Brushes, brushes that look like ah. Yeah, I don't need them. <laughs> Is that right? Well, that's much of that because you can see that I'm not careful with taking care of my brush when I'm painting. I mean, I'm scrubbing and scumbling and everything else on there. But it's the way I wash them okay. and then shape them and everything. And I, I pull really hard when I shape them uh -huh. to get them chiseled like that. Uh, 
men like to have that chiseled look. You know what I mean? <laughs> Terpenoid naturals, yes. Although I might start experimenting, I just saw a thing on uh, reclaiming the, like when you wash your brush in mineral spirits, like the Gamsol mineral spirits, mm -hmm. you can reclaim the old paint that settles to the bottom, and the mineral spirits can be reused indefinitely. If you let, them, let it sit long enough, it'll eventually all settle and you'll have just the mineral spirits clean and clear again for the most part and you can just keep reusing it and then you can take and then the bottom stuff you can actually turn back into paint it'll be kind of a different shades of gray or different colors of gray but you can reuse that as paint. And like her though, how do you get it out of yeah, how do you get it out of Well, you, you, just, you just wait. You have one bucket where you keep the majority of your used mineral spirits and you let it settle entirely. And once it settles, then you just carefully pour off the top portion. Mm. And then until you've poured off everything to where you're basically down to just little bits of mineral spirits or paint sediment at the bottom. Sorry, it's hard for me to think and paint. And talk. You can't paint and think at the same time, you know. <laughs> and then once you have that, you, you spread that out to the sediment and you let the mineral spirits completely evaporate mm -hmm. out of it. And then you just mix linseed oil back into it or walnut oil or whatever you want to mix into it. Mm -hmm. Linseed oil probably would be better. And there you go. And you got some paint. You just put it into a, a tube and you're good to go. How often do you clean your little thing with the terpenoid in it? Oh, I, I never really. I mean, I, I maybe have a couple of times in seven years. Oh, <laughs> so, <wow. laughs> What's in the, in the container on your, on your I the, I put more terpenoid naturals in that to take with me out on location. Oh. I did have mineral spirits in there before, but uh -huh. I've recently put terpenoid naturals into it because I stopped, I started using the wal walnut oil instead of the mineral spirits for my washes uh -huh. because I didn't like that. I was getting really frustrated with the sunken look. Oh, yeah. sorry about that, the camera. And so I changed that out. But now that I've got this understanding about mineral spirits, I might just and that's just but, regular mineral spirits? I mean, there's nothing special? Yeah, well, I'd, I'd use, I don't like the f lesser quality mineral spirits, like this paint thinner and stuff you can get from Home Depot. I wouldn't recommend using that. But the, like the Gamsol mineral spirits, there's, there are no appreciable VOCs from that. You're not going to have the toxins leaking into the air like you would from regular mineral spirits. Okay. According to Robert Gamblin, they have 50 gallon drums open in their factory and the air is cleaner than the air that's coming in from the window. Oh my God. So I don't know, you know, if that's truly accurate, accurate but that's what he claims. He said OSHA has no problem with their air quality in the factory. So that's a, yes. That's the reason you, you do not want to use turpentine in the studio. No. That stuff is really horrible for the health. Yeah. Okay, so then putting in some of these little branches, I would do the same thing with leaves. I might come in different colors of light green leaves and things and sprinkle them across the branches this way and break up a lot of that and give it that nice spring feeling of, of small little leaves everywhere catching the light. And, and then this is also a way to break up some of those. If you get, you, you don't have to worry about getting too many little branches necessarily, as long as they're not thick and, and gloppy, you know, but maintaining the, the feeling of it's a, it's a bright, 
air filled day, sunlight infusing all everything, or at least a nice, a nice uh, light infusing everything kind of day. So that's why I leave my trunks and branches a little uh, broken brush so that it maintains that same feeling or quality. And then I can come on top with bits of uh, leaves and, and that sort of thing to uh, get that same feeling of air everywhere, light bouncing off of things. And then I do that until I feel like it's enough and then I stop. So there's no point where I, someone could say, oh, that's definitely where you have to stop. Mm -hmm. That's all up to you as an artist. Yeah. Just figure out what feels right. Thank you. Any questions then about what we've done so far or concerns or things you wonder about? Oh, well, thank you. Good. I'm glad to hear that. Yeah, you make it look easy, and then when we go home and try it, it's right. Yeah, he did this. Yeah. What's he talking about? All right, real quick, I did notice something that bothers me, and that is this is awfully hard edged here for a shadow like that. It needs to be broken up a bit in places. Like the sun pokes through, and it's just not one, one giant blob of dark. And then pull some of that dark down in here some. Oops, not there. And not so much to where it matches up with that tree over there either. And that's awfully dark, isn't it? Soften out that bottom edge. That. Maybe. That. There we go. Better. No, not entirely. So we're going to. And that's some of that there. That was just an overpoweringly, overpoweringly dark shadow coming down there. Some of those up a little bit. And maybe pull a little bit 
of that into these areas to break up all this brown a little bit. This space is up a little bit. That transitions those greens to the building some. And help push those back some too. That they're farther off into the distance. Back behind everything. bit more carry some of that bright over onto this side of the shore
loosely mix those together so the white is kind of pull some more of that down into that water break up that massive gray and maybe soften out the bottom of this since I like the shape but it's just not quite believable as it is there's something maybe just a touch of color somewhere here as if it's Mm, definitely needs more color side of things than just bright. Huh? All right, so that kind of plays against the what we do with the buildings up top. And that's a little bit more interesting. Maybe a touch of that red somewhere over in here. too much or it becomes I don't want it to be to get busy <laughs> more than it already is here of blue into that river just to break up that gray. I know I got some lavender in there, but a couple of spots of blue to reflect that sky up there will help break up the monotony of that gray. Especially since that sky is peeking through some of those trees and it's going to come down there and reflect into that a little bit here and there. Although, I'm going to watch that, don't I? Because otherwise it'll make the rest of it feel too... doesn't feel quite as... gray if it doesn't have so much blue. All right. Keep the feeling of green. I don't get too much yellow in here. So it is springtime, not fall. We get those early buds, and they do have a lot of that whitish yellow, kind of a pale green color to them.
I'll call that good until Christy looks at it. Thanks for stopping by. Now get out there and paint your own masterpiece. Oh, and before you go, don't forget to subscribe to my channel. And if you're interested in any of my videos, just go to my website at InmanFineArts.com and you can find them all there. Have a great day painting.